After the Franco-Prussian War, everybody did, as we know, start building forts, planning for the next war. And Italy certainly was not staying out of the construction race. However, their borders were slightly different than those of the flatlands of France and Germany. That left the descendants of the amazing Roman building masters now having to construct forts in one of the most beautiful places on earth. Also one of the most dangerous and unfriendly ones, the Alps. Here during the First World War we would see a very different kind of war. As Italy finally joined the war in 1916, mountain warfare was a very different and unforgiving way of warfare, especially for those soldiers in exposed positions at altitudes or snowed in. However, in order to support these soldiers in the forward trenches and lines and observation posts, as well as to block the narrow mountain passes, special artillery forts were constructed in key locations, and we are going to visit one of these. Having been used to seeing me in dark underground tunnels and bombed out fortresses, this will be a breath of fresh air. Literally, thin mountain air that is, at 1730 meters above sea level, we are going to the Fort of Oka. The Italian fortress lines were constructed in several stages. Some of them already started from the 1870s, facing a possible Austrian front of the future, and the second waves were built with slightly lower, thicker walls starting from the 1900s, and finally the last line with reinforced concrete forts with cannons and howitzers in armed domes, with as much of the structures placed underground as possible. The Fort of Olga is located at altitude 1730 meters above sea level and built here between 1908 and 1914 to defend the main alpine passes from both Austria, but also from the nearby Switzerland. From this dominant position in Borno, you could easily reach all the main access routes. Both passes, even the small hiking trails, could be covered from the artillery from this fort. The road that leads to the foot of the fort was built when it was constructed to replace an old mule track. This was necessary in order to transport all the materials up to constructing the actual fortress. Some of these materials were locals, such as the stone that came from the valley below, as did the sand. And one of the first things that had to be constructed to access the fort was a beautiful stone bridge that made it possible to cross the drainage canal. And looking at it will start giving you an idea just exactly how intricate the fort will be given how beautiful this simple bridge could have been, but certainly is not. And you have to make your way up several very much classical Italian hairpin turns as you make it up towards the actual fort. You'll first pass the small barracks that was built in 1935 that housed a detachment of border guards. There's a small door here on the side. You can use that as a secondary entrance to the fort. Also, it was the other side of the escape tunnel in the event of the siege, and also it was used to transport the gunpowder into the powder depots. Narrow hairpin turns in the Alps. Good for defense and a nightmare to drive. Now here you have the barrack building, then a whole lot of turns up to the peak mountain. We come up to the fort up here. Defensive entanglement, just like the French forts, barbed wire, right here on the top of the mountain. This looks like a World War I era remains of one of those cannons. The fort was built following the best studies of military architecture from the very beginning of the century, starting with those of the Belgium engineer, General Henri Brelmont, him we have heard of a lot. Large blocks of stone covered with a very thick layer of cement, gravel, and sand that came from the nearby valley. 
and the strategic position on top of this mountainside, the fort added a lot of resources, obstacles, that made it almost impossible for any enemy to make it up the valley and up the hillside to actually gain foothold and attack the fort itself. There was also enough water and foodstuffs in the event of a siege that could sustain the fort's crews for more than a month. It really is all about location, location, location. Plant your fort where you can cover the entrance and have some beautiful barbecues on the roof. Just saying, that's what I would have done. There truly is something to be said for a beautiful building with a defensive purpose. And this was built in the design of the Brelmont, but this is absolutely gorgeous. The masonry, the location, the view, what a stunning place. Seeing a moat come down here. And then here is a steel casemate for defense in both directions from what I can tell. And I can't help to wonder how thick that is. I suppose this is not really a moat. This is just a whole lot of spiky slowing down. So the whole mountaintop have pretty much been spiked full of spikes and barbed wire. I would be surprised if there weren't landmines here back in the day. Making it harder and harder to get to the actual artillery fort. It really does appear that this wall, this inner moat, circles around the entire fort area. So I was wondering what the outer defenses look like because here you have the fort, here you have the moat circling around the fort which is inside this mountain. And here on the outside there's also spikes and barbed wire running along the outer perimeter of this moat. So the moat just shields, it doesn't circle. Now the batteries and observation domes. I'm seeing two observation domes and then the battery as I'm nicely crossing the barbed wire as one should. And with a little luck I can circle around the fort this way. And see the barbed wire is just lining the fort both inside the moat and on top of the wall of it. In triple layers just like we've seen in France, Belgium. Barbed wire is everywhere. I said I was going to stop mentioning barbed wire and landmines. Just take it as a given that they're somewhere. Just like the mosquitoes. They're here too. Up. We are on top of the mountain. And then this is where the wall begins. This is the beginning of the upper moat. And then there's another wall down here. Running along in front of the fort. Of course, again, covered by barbed wire. Entanglements, spikes. Lots and lots and lots of spikes. And we can walk through the spikes. And here is a pit and there would have been a machine gun or a cannon. That would have had to be a machine gun. There's no reason whatsoever to put an anti-tank cannon in here. And the moat is a bit overgrown. And the gun is defending this section 
of the moat where the spikes and remember there's a drop to the right looks like a good 30 centimeter armored plate so the moat is a bit overgrown This is the slope you would have to climb and of course we are beside that immediate slope on top of one of the outcroppings of one of the Alps. In 1938 the fort also changed names and was named after Captain Corrado Venini. He won the gold medal for military valor after having died in World War I fighting in Trentino in May 1916 and sadly his son Guillermo will follow the same tragic fate when he died fighting in Greece in 1941. In Italy there are many forts. Like this one, there are only three fortifications. Yeah, this so is, this is very, very good. Yeah. This is not the drawbridge. The drawbridge, yes. This is the drawbridge. Yeah, the drawbridge. So it would go under... Yes, the drawbridge, they can open the drawbridge using that one. And that would wheel inside, into and the side? Yeah. Just like... A Opening the trench at the end of the fort, and so the enemy... Uh, and you have firing positions uh, here as well. Yeah. The movable... <laughs> wheel for cranking, movable brakes, yeah. Oh, that takes a lot of cranking. It's very small. <laughs> does, it, does it still it's work? It's very small, yeah. Does it still work? Oh no. Is it in the right, is it in the right place? What, was that where it was? Yes. Was, uh, yeah. <laughs> does it work? <laughs> and now it's... it's uh... So this is technically the guard room? Yeah, the guard room, yeah. Ooh, spiky things. Yeah, like, I like the barbed wire. I thought this was a, di a display. That was actually there. Oh! Yes. When I looked at it from the outside, it looked so nice. I thought it was, you know, display. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the armor plate and the armor doors. But of course, if somebody got in there, you, you have problems already, a little bit. Ooh, I like, I like secret holes. Ooh, there's an underground. What's down there? Have an idea. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's the drawbridge. Will be lighted uh, next year. That's cool. So will be put a glass floor in. So yeah, that's the corner of the drawbridge. That's very cool. <laughs> how how deep is is this dam? Uh, five, 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 five meters. meters. Yeah. Something you don't come across. Isn't accessible to the public, but. Uh, 100 people, That's 90 right. soldiers, and 10 officers. In France, if you had big artillery forts, 200, 300, 400, 500 people. Oh. So you don't need, but you don't need anymore. No, there are uh, many people who are on the top of the mountains, and so. Yeah. Mini rail? There's, uh, there's landing trolleys and elevator over there um, allowed the transportation of shells. Of course. So, okay. <laughs> uh, a little kitchen because there wasn't a refectory, and so every soldier could uh, pass with, uh, uh, with their team. So you had coal, kit coal? It was uh, on the top of the mountain. So the ones in the mountain did this, and you, there was a coal? Only, only this one, yeah. Yeah, and then you put coal. Uh, coal. Yeah. And yeah, cool. <laughs> How, that's a hundred, that's a hundred, ten years old. Yeah, so this is the new one. Good, one, good. one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This? this one, yeah, yeah. That is, wow. Yes, it is used uh, in the first uh, defense line in order to, uh, to bring, uh, to bring hot food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just looks in really, really good condition. Yeah. And 
there are, there are the latrines. The difference between the officers and the troops. Ooh. The difference was the white. Of course. 80 centimeters for the troops and the 120 centimeters for the officers. <laughs> so, so they, uh, they will stand up? Yeah. Uh, the officers too? Yeah. <laughs> Just like in France. And then the officers' bathroom. Oh yes. The difference is the light. <laughs> Cannon at the end of the moat. It is a nice display piece, but it was a little heavy to sit there. Where did that come from? This one come from uh, Bohemia. Bohemia. Yeah. It is. It was what? used during the Second World War. Yeah. It's uh, by Skoda. By Skoda. Yeah. Oh, this is a Skoda Werke. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I like Skoda Werke. It was uh, built in uh, 1919. Sk Skoda built some great things. They built a lot of really, really good stuff. Well, it's nice that it's here. It's a little big for close defense. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is just so, it is so gorgeous. You see all this cement and rebar. This is beautiful. Uh, yeah. But this was built in stone yeah. and cement. A, blo a large block of stones uh, covered with a uh, thick layer of cement, yeah. Was there steel in the cement? Yeah. There was steel, so yeah. there's rebar as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, goody, goody. Because that was a big problem for the one World War I forts in Europe did not have uh, steel. Ah, and yeah. that was a big problem. Oh, this one. <laughs> there is the elevator. Oh, and there's a turning table. I get it. So that would go straight up to the cannon, to the, to the floor. This was three floors? No, oh, this one and the, uh, and the upstairs. And then and then uh, uh, the terrace, uh, yes. And this was... What is that? What is this? It was used... Uh, so for, oh, that's yes. for the trolley for the Yeah, for the trolley, yeah. Of course. Yeah. So the stairs going downwards, you have no idea. The least couple here. <laughs> we can see the central path. Yes. So here you would have a machine gun or a cannon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, uh, garden air. Uh, machine gun garden air. Okay. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Just to, just to come down to a defensive position. Yeah. I like it. There's a lot of detail. It was built in two years. Only two years with 400 people. Really? Yeah, really. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually impressive. However, <laughs> Italians <laughs> knew something about building. <laughs> the Romans knew something about building, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> the gun turret. This one, oh no, this one is the perimeter cavity walls for ventilation. Yeah. <laughs> so the inner and this is the outer, nothing. Oh, I like. <laughs> and the same thing here. I like. Details. The disappearing machine gun turrets. This one. This is the east gun turret. And then so we're the looking. Is also the, the west. Is this electric? No. Uh, no. With the. Manual, uh, Manual, yeah. Yeah, a disappearing machine gun turret because uh, if, the enemy, if the enemy arrived there, or arrived here, sorry, could be manually lowered until it, it, it disappeared underground. So this was all, this was all manual? Yeah. 
and the, the disappearing, the up and down was manual and the rotation was manual. Yeah, yeah. Rotation, 360 degrees, yeah. This is in very, very, very good condition. That's very nice to see. Yeah. The machine gun's missing. <laughs> <laughs> So heavy, heavy machine gun. Yeah. Does it work? No, this is locked. No. You haven't fixed it yet. Oh, with counterweights, of course. Yeah. So where do you control the up and down? Where? This is all up and down, right? Yeah. Where's the? Hi. But it's very nicely restored, I, I, I gotta give it to you. We just gotta get a gun back in there. This is where the turn would be. Yeah. Okay. Just actually film it. So that's where the handle would be. That would connect to that crank. That would connect to that crank. That would then connect to the turret wheels and the weights. Are the cannons back? The cannons are, are uh, at the first floor. So, munition? Is there ammunition? Yeah, I'll show my eyes again. It's empty because. Uh... But you don't have any shells. Holy, this is it's gorgeous! Yeah. 1937, they were stolen. In a, in a house in Bormio in order to improve the temperature inside the fort. Yeah. That's a radiator. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> we will see the corkal burner <laughs> that was very, very, very little for this uh, big, big building. Okay, so these are the men's, uh, this is the men's barracks. Yes, uh, soldiers slept uh, here. On wooden plank beds, there, there was a, 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 a layer of hay in order to make more comfortable <laughs> the beds. But um, this is uh, one of the holiest part of the fort because uh, uh, only here they, uh, they wrote letters to their families and they prayed God that the war ended. And so, was so how many soldiers in this room? In this room, 45 soldiers. Over there, there were two floors of bedroom. Of, uh, I see the, the room opens so up. The, oh, yes. The eye there. The <laughs> I mean, hey, it's warm. <laughs> so. I have noticed that there are still animals outside in the nature. Yeah. World War One or World War Two? One. One. Yeah. World War One. And the sleeping bag. You know, oh, that's sheepskin. Is that sheepskin? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, I would imagine in the winter it got really cold here. Yeah, but uh, they were lucky. Because we're they lucky. Were not to uh, have it all. They were not allowed to, yeah. <laughs> your uh, permanent fortification was. It better. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, as, long as, you, as long as you're not out there. Yeah. And uh, is the infirmary? And so, uh, did, uh, urgent treatments uh, were made uh, also. Did yeah. surgery too? Yeah. So you had a, you had a doctor here. Yeah. The mountains were uh, not so accessible. That's that's and true. So they were too. They the were climate too. was uh, very variable, and so it wasn't easy to attach uh, in high mountains. Yeah. Yeah, the plane. On the top of the mountains, uh, they reach uh, 305, uh, uh, 3,500 meters, and so it's so easy. 
pr you were protected flying. pretty well with him, I yeah. Ah, the engineering. The electricity was produced by a, a diesel engine which drove the dynamo connected to heat. Uh, the generator supplied 130 volts and the electricity was uh, accumulated in uh, batteries in the next uh, room. Uh, the black smoke produced by this generator was uh, filtered through a cistern containing water and so the, uh, the soot was deposited and only the white smoke could escape into the air and so, uh, so uh, the, the fort was invisible to the enemy. <laughs> And this was a diesel generator? Diesel right? generator. In World War II, there were only f uh, 50 people here in, in the beginning of the Because uh, the other were. Uh, <laughs> they were busy in Abyssinia. Yeah. <laughs> This really is built very, very nicely. Yeah. See a lot of electricity running through the officer's room. There were only 10 people and so. So they were extra special. It was hotter, hotter than. <laughs> but so they were all, to, all together, the officers. The commander didn't have his own room. Yeah. All together. Radio or telephone? Telephone. But in order to communicate? Yes. No. No radio, no telephone. The telephone in order to communicate with the, the top of the mountains. This one is the whole, the west camera. Yes. I like this. So with the mountains, they would they would communicate with the telephone. Yeah, from here. What is this? Four centimeters. Four centimeters. Yeah. And this was to defend. To defend the entry of the fort. If the enemy is uh, will, uh, if the enemy is uh, yes, pass the drawbridge. <laughs> and they're on the other side too. Yeah. <laughs> There is the sun, it's uh, hot in this place. Really <laughs> and so, in winter was uh, the best place uh, to live. Really? It's the, hot, it's the hottest uh, room. <laughs> the sauna. 
very beautiful, very clean, and incidentally very well restored after having been completely abandoned in 1958, where the cannons were unfortunately scrapped. Very importantly, the fort was connected through phone lines from the command center all the way up to the various mountain peaks where the observation posts were spotting the enemy and could call in firing missions, and of course also to the rear command. So I know, I know how this works. So on the back here, you would have a guy that would work with the detonators through this hole, or this was just technical. That's also possible, but that's original technical. I'm just curious if this is where they had the detonators. Sorry? There you have the shells. Yeah on top of the shells. One of the things that keeps striking me about this fort is its beautiful elegance and simplicity. It is very simply laid out here along the hallways, the armories, dormitories, infirmaries, and the ammo depots upstairs are the cannons, the office for the commanding officer, and on the other side is the powder kegs and other offices, and entrance guards, and the moat. There are they disappear in machine gun towers, uh, the west. So what's in there? The room. Was that the magazine for yeah, the machine Yeah, it was gun? a magazine, yeah, for, uh, for the, for the disappearing machine gun. Yeah, that makes figures. Same system, used to be a crank, and a connection, and another connection, all mechanical, and I'm guessing this was done by one guy. One person would turn this. I guess it depends how long the handle was. <laughs> But it wouldn't be that heavy. You have four counterweights, so it wouldn't be that heavy to turn. Uh, yeah, I think it was heavy. Okay. But when you have the counterweights, it's a little more balanced. Ah, ah okay. It was balanced. Hey, yeah. These turrets were armed with a Gardner double barrel machine gun of 10.4 millimeters. Interesting choice, I will say. The ammunition will just be brought up here. They'll just bring up the ammunition like this. That is so cool. That is almost 18th century. This is so wonderfully, elaborately, delicately built. Oh, there's an indoor latrine. Yeah. Ah, you learned something. So is this water coming down or water going up? It, it really is built like a villa. Once again, something the Romans were pretty damn good at. We're building nice houses. <laughs> and for ventilation? Yeah. Has your window and you see the roof of the fort. We can 
it's a little wide in the port. 52 meters wide. So this is the roof, this is the top floor, the fighting floor, and there's for the munition. Yeah. Munition for rails. The transportation, again. yeah, of shells. So you have all the fighting positions, all the domes, and a magazine for each yeah, dome. Yeah, for, uh, for munitions as well. Yeah. The other rooms on the top floor were for munition stores, one for each of the cannons, and the commander's room, which was located in the corner. And from there, all communication systems were going through a copper pipe, intercom. It went out through one of the oldest established communication technologies, that of yelling. But it would enable communication with the munition stores, the cannons, and the commander. And I will say it is a pleasure to see this fort intact, because a lot of the other Italian forts did not share a similar fate. I'll visit them this year and you'll see for yourself what's left of them. There's the top of the elevator coming up here, down to the hallway. And down here, you have the observation and the commander's office where the telephone communication to the troops up in the Alps were. And then all these guns have been melted down, there being only these four in existence. It's just beyond terrible. There are sister forts that have cameras like these. It's absolutely terrible that they are no longer here. If only replicas could be built of these. The installation and removal of the gun barrels could be done without dismantling the cupola. These could be lowered through the internal staircase connecting the battery, the corridor, and the domes with the help of the rings embedded in the walls out the windows through winches and ropes, mules and men. Pretty much just like we've seen in the forts of France or Germany and the same time. You can see the rings and the walls. For when you bring in the spare barrels, there's a hook in the ceiling. And then the window opening is right in front so you can bring the long barrel in. Why is there a screw? It's a sprinkler. Sprinkler? New or old? Old. World War One. Yeah. There was a sprinkler system. Yeah, yeah. Holy shit. That is so cool. Yeah. We can see from here. And I love that there's a sprinkler system. And I love that there's plenty of bathrooms. With lots of electricity going through them. So, there is an underground. It's nice and warm. Very small and comfortable stairs. I am a big fan. <laughs> uh -huh. One, this one, the other one, other magazine. And there's this is a, a little house within the tunnels that's not touching the walls. Yeah. And then there's more tunnels. So what was this? This one. It's the powder magazine. That's the powder magazine. Yeah. Because World War One, you had the black. You still use black powder. Yeah. Uh, yes. So. In order to have a constant temperature, where? Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the explosives were uh, stolen, were uh, stocked yeah. in a wooden uh, box in order to reduce radiation. Yeah, friction and black powder is also bad. So you literally built this little hut inside the tunnel. This one is... Uh, yeah, you see one of the sections. The other one is uh, bigger. The other one? There's another one, he says. The other one, you say. So this is the other one. I like it when there's more than one. Oh, yes, it is. It completely shields from the walls, all for humidity and temperature. Yeah. You literally go, yeah. literally go around the building. There's this much room between the building and the wall. You can actually go around the building. And lots of electricity. Make a turn. <laughs> I've walked around the building, inside the building, inside the tunnel. Okay, I've walked around. I've walked around the building, inside the tunnel, inside the building. That's how it's getting go. I love this. That's very really neat. So, how much power will be stored here? The outside, yeah, outside. Where, the, where the road is. Yes, I thought that when I when I looked at it, I was like, "That's <laughs> that must be it." What is up there? What does that look like up, upstairs? Upstairs, sir. Uh, oh, this is the building. Building uh, before entering the fort. You can see outside. Uh, yeah, this. but there was no. There was no stairs from that building. That's just ventilation. No, 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 no. Uh -huh. Only for the area for the underground uh, rooms. Oh, see, I thought. Can go. <laughs> <laughs> boiler room. Little, 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 very little boiler room. <laughs> so there was hot water for the men to to bathe. For the shower, was the hot water. Hot water for the, for the shower. Yeah. 
No, uh, no, only to hate the hair. The hot water arrives from the kitchens. Ooh, yeah. The cocoa burner, very, 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 very little for a big oh. building. <laughs> they ate uh, uh, the hair with uh, this. And it wasn't efficient, and so in 1937 they improved the temperature with the, the, some radiators. But uh, for this dispersion, the temperature yeah. <laughs> increased uh, once in 1935. This is a beautiful old piece of equipment. So they literally put the radiators in here. No, because. Uh, Are the same in all the country, and so here we are at uh, uh, 1734 meters at altitude. It's and uh, so was a uh, little for uh, this temperature. Yeah, you needed something a little extra. Yeah. And the yeah. underground tunnels uh, that arise uh, in rich uh, room, the hair hated this room thanks to these uh, underground tunnels. So this is where the hot air would literally travel yeah. <laughs> throughout the fort. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yes. And so the temperature inside wasn't so hot. Uh, I see six radiators. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, hot air goes up, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> but these are all utility tunnels. <laughs> and pipes and steel doors. This is a steel door. So, yeah, so literally those radiators, yeah. <laughs> those and the ones in the next room, that was pretty much it, <laughs> to send the hot air up. Yeah. I mean, they are pretty. <laughs> this, is, this is the first time in my life I have seen a bank of connected radiators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A radiator bank. <laughs> there is always a first time. <laughs> yes. Well, I haven't seen the sprinkler system either, so... Yay! <laughs> and that's how we come to places like this. Where the air is thin. Those, those radiators. And then there's those radiators. Where does that go? Uh, this one uh, reached... Uh, um, the office. Oh, the office, okay. Yeah. So the officers could come down here yeah. and stay warm. And then you had all the radiators in the fort yeah. as well. Yeah. They probably did more. But yeah, it's new. But uh, there was a, a stair. Because uh, the guards uh, have a uh, double function in order to defend uh, the drawbridge, but also to make sure the heater was running. Yeah. Feed, feed the cocks and the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love this. This is good. So this was... Yeah, here you see... You see the cement? You see what's left of the wood case. You put up the wood case and then you build the cement around it. Yeah. Yeah. The cement arrived in Tirano, uh, 35 kilometers far from ER, and then uh, <sighs> it was brought uh, ER. Some of the best cement in World War II was made by Italian. Yeah. Yay. Ready, ready. For the Yara, in these rooms uh, underground, uh, there is uh, 10, 12, uh, yeah. So, constant temperature. 
Outstanding. I like. And I like these small stairs too. So water or fuel? Yeah, for water, yeah. Water, okay. Water. It almost looks like it's an afterthought. <laughs> it almost looks like, oh, we forgot. <laughs> I mean, it does. It, I mean, everything is so dedicated. Yeah. You almost think, oh, we should put this in there too. You can see the wall mm -hmm. and then the barbed wire. What is so impressive here is that the fort's four cannons were 120 caliber by 40 could actually fire 12,800 meters and over these nearby mountains. They would literally fire from here over the mountains and hit the Austrians on the other side who had actually no way of responding to this fire or striking back at the fort. The armored cupolas were built in the English factory Armstrong in Posoli in Italy. They rest on large ball bearings and can rotate 360 degrees with the cannon. The actual domes were considered a light type, meaning they're only 40 millimeters thick instead of the usual 140 millimeters, so lower in strength. That choice was made, dictated by the fact that this fort was in a position that was out of sight of enemy artillery. Actually, in fact, it was never hit by anything, as it was way beyond the maximum range of the Austrian guns. We need to find some cannons. And they would fire over this mountain at the German-Austrian troops on the other side. No wonder you need long-barreled howitzers to fire over that peak. How high is that peak? Over there, there are 3,500 meters. Over And that's the observation dome that is in the commander's yeah, office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Commander. And then you had another machine gun there. Yes. What did you do? <laughs> so you can... All the trees were gone. There were no trees, right? No trees, no trees. So you could actually see everything and fire on everything if it got too close. And here we have the moat full of spikes. And of course the fence wouldn't be there, the trees wouldn't be there. Have a machine gun position that would be able to overlook the entire valley and the approach of the entire valley. These looks like a World War I French design. General Briamont the best. Yes, he had some good ideas and Val Furva, Val oh, di yes. Sotto and Val di Dentro. Go down that valley too. You can dominate the main alpine passes such as Passo Stelio that was over right that mountain. Hands for the closest defensive position. Inland. All the way around, down here is the moat, Odokim Valley, hilltop, and all of that 
would be protected by this guy. And I guess observation would be nice, but you don't really need direct observation considering you're shooting over another mountain. So you're completely really relying on forward observers. The Italians also fought on the Western Front at Verdun, this grave dedicated to Italian soldiers. But the Italians' entry into World War I is one that seemingly was a little unprepared on behalf of the Italian military and seemed a little bit of a gamble, hoping for gain of territory by doing so. It did not work out that well for Italy during World War I, and the battles at the Cordonza with the Italian leadership and the decisions that were made by military command is one that's very interesting and very much worth looking into in detail in another episode. But given how horrible it must have been to make it all the way up with mule train to tops of peaks where soldiers would throw grenades at you and fire across icy valleys to do battle in these snow-covered stony mountains one must think that the crews of this fortress must have felt themselves quite lucky to be here and not sitting on top exposed to weather, shells, and even enemies throwing rocks at you from time to time. End of the 1930s, barracks were built for training and housing of more soldiers. Of course, this place was not fortified or occupied for World War II as Germany, Austria, and Italy was allied. And only 50 men were stationed here for training and garrison duties. I truly do love visiting fortresses, bunkers, battlefields all over the world to see the different ways and different designs, how the construction was inspired or uninspired. But this was truly one of the more beautiful experiences I've had. Not only is this fort so exceptionally clean and beautiful, it is on a peaceful, wonderful alpine top, which makes it just a pleasure to visit, if not to walk up and down the hillside. And of course, the best part is the food. Right nearby is a small family-owned business with a restaurant, and I'm pretty sure there's an Italian grandma in there cooking. That in itself makes it worth a visit. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebmus nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.